Remember that in the, in the uh, tabernacle, in the temple, God fellowshiped with men, not from the judgment seat, not from the condemnation seat, not from the punishment seat, not from the vengeance seat, but from the mercy seat. And uh, so the prophets continually remind Israel, this is not a legal agreement, this is a spousal relationship. It depends on love. It depends on trust. It doesn't depend on keeping law. It depends on love and trust. And somehow they didn't get the message. So in the fullness of time, God comes down to earth himself and walks among men, as he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. Remember when Jesus Christ is in the garden of Gethsemane, Think of how he came down and walked in the cool of the evening with Adam and Eve. And then see how we go back to the creation. In the beginning, God separates light from darkness and light comes forth. And now Jesus Christ comes to separate light from darkness in the world. And above all, to separate light from darkness in the hearts of man. So that there can be true life again. And when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and we see the one thief who acknowledges Christ as being the good and for the first time realizes his own evil. The cross of Jesus Christ has become the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for him. And when he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the cross of Jesus Christ becomes the tree of life for him. Because Jesus Christ is the fruit of the tree of life, as we have life in no other except in our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the cross of Jesus Christ still separates light from darkness. The one thief who denies and the one thief who realized and accepted. And the cross of Christ is the boundary between darkness and light. And Jesus Christ still strives to separate darkness from light in the hearts of each of us. And this really is our response to that, to desire the light rather than the darkness. And to say that the light shines forth in the darkness and the darkness has neither comprehended nor overpowered it. And for us to seek that light, that's really what we're called to. The church doesn't send anyone to heaven or to hell. The church prepares us for the final encounter with the glory and the love of Jesus Christ. So that when we receive it, our conscience is open to the right or to the left. And this is the life of the church, and this is what the church is really there for. So the whole liturgical cycle of the church is there to impart knowledge and understanding to us, not in ways that are beyond comprehension, but in ways that slowly, little by little, move and open the heart and open the mind to greater and greater knowledge through participating in that knowledge instead of just reading about it or looking at it from the distance. Now when you take a look at the Divine Liturgy, the altar of the church is a type of paradise. And if you look at the book of Revelation, you say, Behold, I looked and I saw the doors opening in the heavens, and I looked into paradise. So at the beginning of the Orthodox liturgy, when the priest opened the royal gates, Behold, I looked and I saw the doors opening in the heavens. And you look in, and when uh, John the Evangelist is describing his vision, he sees, first of all, he sees Christ clothed like the Torah, you know, the Torah was wrapped in swaddling clothes, and then it was clothed in royal raiment and semi-precious stones with a crown on top. And it's sitting in the niche in the altar, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the high place. And so John, first he envisions seeing Christ as the Torah, because the Word was made flesh. He's talking about the Torah being made flesh. And so you see, the Torah is a type of Christ, it's a type of the Messiah. So we see the Gospel book on the Holy Table, also very often with semi-precious stones and things. Mm -hmm. And you see it on the Holy Table, and this is the first part of the vision. And then the priest brings the Holy Gifts over, and he sets the discos and the chalice on. And, you know, after the priest uncovers these things, he should step aside. He should never stand between the people and the Holy Gifts and say, take, eat. He should stand to the side and say, take, eat, this is my body. So the people are looking directly at one like a lamb that was slain, exactly as in the book of Revelation. It's in that part of the liturgy that we, we need to understand that we're standing in the midst of the church 
being called toward paradise, being called to return to that communion with Christ in paradise. And then when we receive the Holy Communion, the communion chalice itself becomes the tree of life, and the fruit of the tree of life is Jesus Christ, and we're receiving Jesus Christ. And understanding that we're supposed to be opening our hearts to have Christ dwelling within us too at the same time. So the Divine Liturgy leads us toward paradise, always toward paradise, always toward our return to paradise. But in the midst of the church we gain our knowledge and our understanding and our illumination. And what is that illumination? Why is it in the midst of the church? Because it's in the midst of the congregation. We're worshiping together as one, as one voice, with one heart, with one mind. And in, the, in the, the, the mystery of the parish church is that we have people of all different kinds and categories, all different personalities, all different characters, and we're struggling to learn to have an unselfish love for each one of them, so that the community is united together by an unselfish love. And this is how we defeat the power of Satan, and how the liturgy leads us to return to paradise, because it's leading us back toward an unselfish love. And uh, the parish is the proving ground for that, really. So in the Divine Liturgy, we receive understanding, knowledge, and illumination because we're a community worshiping together with all of our different characteristics, all of our different problems, all of our different passions, all of our different personalities. We're all worshiping together with one heart and one mind, being united together in Christ, and learning to have an unselfish love for each other, in disregarding all of these differences amongst us. And the parish is the proving ground. And once we learn to do that within, we can expand that outward toward the rest of the world. So that's uh, the liturgy is, is, is really intended for that, to draw us back into that. My first teacher, Father John Romanides, is to tell us that religion is a neurobiological illness, he said. Faith is its cure. <laughs> uh, because, well, sometimes you said orthodoxy is cure, sometimes you said faith is cure, but I understand because religion is what religion is what faith collapses into when it no longer has any power in our lives. Mm. And we have this ideology, and the ideology is no longer, a, we use Jesus Christ, we use God, but it isn't about Jesus Christ, and it isn't about God, it's about me. No, my religion is now about me, not about Christ because it's become an ideology that focuses on me and my belief and my perspective. And uh, it can no longer, and this is part of why Christianity is in the retreat, because it's become a religion and an ideology. So it's no longer about inner transformation, it's about making other people like me. So see, God is no longer the real message, even though his name is used. That's why so much of what is, what is called worship but isn't, it's about feeling good about me. You know, you go to a church and there's a rock concert, and you get all excited and you feel, but you don't feel any different than if it was the Beatles. You just think you feel, you think it's about God, but it isn't, it's about you. Uh, it, it's, it's about making me feel good about myself. And it isn't at all about the transformation of the heart. There's no transformation in that stuff. And so we've reshaped and distorted and destroyed worship into something that is about me and me feeling good about myself instead of worshiping God. And that's an ideology. But we can all, even in the Orthodox world, we can fall into this ideology, you know. Um, very often, I mean, among my people, well, if you're, not, if, you're, if you're a Serb, you have to be Orthodox. If you're not Orthodox, you're not a Serb. And I, wait a minute, now, Orthodox now is just a part of our national identity? That's an idolatry too. <laughs> we can all get into that. Uh, so there's all, you know, we always have to be on guard for this collapsing it into a religion.